Welcome to The Intellectual. I'm your host, David Dawson. And for the last three years, I've been bringing you creative and intellectually stimulating content with some of San Diego's top creative talent, as well as Hollywood's, on The Intellectual Podcast. But now, today, we're going to start a brand new venture. We're going to satisfy the desires of some of our biggest fans, and we're going to start bringing you our interviews on video to streaming, to broadcast, wherever you consume your content, we're gonna deliver it. And we're gonna do it here on The Intellectual. And joining me on this new video venture is my co-host, Whitney Wegman. Thank you so much, David. So for today, we have a really special treat for you guys. We have been doing, as David mentioned, lots of West Coast interviews, San Diego, LA. But for today's interview, we flew all the way to New York for our next guest. And he is a very exciting guest. Some of you may know him as Mr. Freeze on Gotham. Or the ill-fated Meacham from House of Cards. Our guest for today is Mr. Nathan Darrow. And Nathan uh, is a friend of yours, actually. He is. Nathan and I met in Kansas City many years ago. I'm not going to tell you guys how many years ago, <laughs> but a while ago, uh, working in theater, actually. We actually talk a little bit about that experience. We do. With Nathan. Um, he was so gracious to invite us out to his home in New Jersey uh, in between some of his gigs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just wanted to deliver on a much wider and expansive experience with this new program. So we went all the way to New York. She actually flew away from planning her wedding. <laughs> to come do these interviews that we did in New York. So thank you so much oh, for taking the time. You're welcome. It was a whirlwind, but it was it was a lot of fun. It was a whirlwind. We did like a whole bunch of interviews in just a matter of like 24 hours, but that's what New York City is good for. You never sleep, you get it done. And in that vein, let's go ahead and move right into our interview with Nathan Darrow. How did you guys meet? Like, that's probably a good start. Um, go, for no, go for it. No, go for it. We met in Kansas City. Um, we both were working uh, for the Heart of America Shakespeare Festival on a production of Romeo and Juliet. Hmm. Nathan was our Romeo. That's right. And you were? I was doing tech. I was backstage. Oh, that was your, your tech time. I built the things, the bed, the bower, a lot of stuff, actually. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, what was it like doing Shakespeare in Kansas City? It was doing Shakespeare, which is always very interesting. Mm -hmm. It was great. I mean, um, Kansas City is where I'm from uh, okay. originally. So, um, you know, my path was I, uh, I I left town to go to college and then went straight to acting school in New York. Uh, and then after only a few years, I, I came back to Kansas City. Uh, and then ended up working professionally in that community for a number of years. Uh, and it was fantastic. And when it comes to, you know, the Shakespeare Festival, for instance, uh, that production of Romeo and Juliet, um, the actor who played Mercutio was an actor uh, called David Fritz, who, when I was like a 16-year-old kid in high school, I saw him play Biff Lohman at the at the <laughs> then the Missouri Repertory Theater, and it is still a performance that is you know imprinted on me as just being uh, you know one of the most powerful I've ever been in the company of. Uh, so, you know, working in Kansas City with all of those people was was uh, was a really awesome thing for me. That's really cool. It's a it's it's fascinating to me how a performance that you see when you're young can really kind of impact you and affect you and kind of ride with you all the way along. Um, I was telling Whitney in our first podcast together about um, how I went to go see Peter Coyote um, in a very first run of Jake's Women, Neil Simon's mm -hmm. play mm -hmm. at, at the Old Globe in San Diego when I was in the sixth grade. And, you know, here it is 30 years later <laughs> and I still like can't get that performance out of my head. It's one of the reasons why I became a director. Like yeah. I wanted to work with actors and do powerful performances like that. How did it feel to be able to work with somebody who was for you that 
kind of young influence like was it intimidating uh, um honestly by that point i had been working in the community for a while mm-hmm. and i had worked with dave i think two years prior in the shakespeare festival and he was he was benedict in a production of much ado about nothing where mm-hmm. like claudio uh and that was that was the one where i remember feeling I don't know that it was intimidated. It was a little bit intimidated. It was a little bit just like, you know, I was still in awe and I was, I had also seen him do things even after Death of a Salesman that right. were like, you know, when you see an actor, you know. But I think the thing about David is, you know, he's so comforting and open. And I, I think you get over that really fast. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, no, by that point we had, we had hung out, you know, we had had, more than a few beers together. So it was, uh, that was great. I mean, so it sounds like, even though it was like Kansas city, which, you know, to me growing up in San Diego and having just come from New York city, doesn't sound like a big deal, but it sounds like it was a really good acting experience. Actually. Yeah. People are, I'm, I'm sure people aren't aware of this, but Kansas city has a lot of live theater and a lot of opportunities for it. There's the KC Rep, there's the Unicorn Theater, which is a more avant-garde theater. Um, Theater for young audiences, which is great because it's for small children. I actually got to perform there. Uh, I was Becky Thatcher and Tom Sawyer. And it was a blast because exactly what you were saying earlier, like the experience of doing theater and, and touching the lives of young children, you get to see it on a daily basis. And from my understanding, even since I left, there are more theaters that have sprung up. Uh, the Fish Tank is one that I would love to mention because they do a lot of new works and a lot of clown pieces, which is, you know, close to my heart. I love the clowns. <laughs> <laughs> we all know Whitney loves the clowns. So uh, we'll be right back with more with Nathan Darrow. So it sounds like Kansas City is a really good place to kind of get started in acting. Absolutely. It's a great place to get your feet wet. And I mentioned this in the podcast that we did. It's still a small town atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows everyone else. You run into the same people. Right. And so it is a community and it's a family theatrical environment almost. These people become your family. But eventually you have to grow beyond your family and Nathan Dara moved to New York City. You said you came to New York to to do some uh, acting schools. Where did you? Right. Where did you um, go? Well, I went to I went to NYU uh, to the to the the graduate acting program, mm-hmm. um, which uh, is a kind of you know a three year you know intense conservatory uh, you know with the same folks and the same faculty and like a kind of a little class. Um, at that time, it was headed by uh, Zelda Fitzhamlin, who, uh, rest in peace, just passed away only, uh, maybe only a month ago. Oh. Uh, but she had, uh, she's one of the pioneers of the, you know, regional theater movement in the United States. She founded Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. And so she was, she was in charge of things there. And so she kind of brought that idea of, you know, a company of actors was her, was kind of her guiding vision. So she was trying to train us to be able to be in a company, a, an actual like resident company of actors. Turns out those don't really exist anymore in this country. So we were kind of being trained for a system that was not like, was not even there necessarily to, necessarily to catch us. But turns out that's still really good acting training. And, you know, our, you know, uh, producers, directors, writers, you know, still benefit from actors that are, you know, just trained to be, to be versatile, to be able to understand, you know, um, uh, where a particular writer might be coming from and also trained to kind of take in the whole, the whole thing, the whole play, the whole story. Um, yeah, it was a good, it was really good, intense time. I, I, I ran into a lot of, you know, 
I, I ran into the real thing a lot. You know, a lot of mm-hmm. people who were like, mm, that's, that's it. That's, that's it. I probably was a little young for the experience. I think looking back, you know, I think I was, uh, having gone straight from college, uh, I think I was still in a, a slightly institutional mindset, which is tough when you're trying to learn something that is creative. Right. Yeah, because, you know, I understand well, that education like, by nature has a certain structure to it. But yes. Once you leave that, you've got to kind of learn to break the structure a little well, and, yeah. and, and well, find, find a little bit of your own path, right? I mean, yes. I would say this I would say that structure is one thing. And structure is probably uh, consistently necessary mm-hmm. for a person who's pursuing something creative. You know, it's the um, it's it's the effort to please um, the instructor. Yeah, is like you want to try and get the grade as opposed right. to finding what is your path, your right, t- right, yeah. right. That was my first year of grad school as well. <laughs> it took yeah. me a while to break that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's hard. I mean, because as the artist, you have to be guided by a light that only you really know. I mean, only you know what that is. I mean, maybe somebody more experienced can like sort of shape and respond to, but the kind of real thing, well, it just, it just can get lost in, in the structure of yeah, and academia. Go quiet. You know? When do you feel like you found that for yourself? Was there a particular production where it was like, okay, this is, this is how I I do this for me, not for this instructor. Well, You're still finding it for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I would like to say that there was there was one, or I mean, I, I also don't want to say that um, that I'm like in recovery from. <laughs> training because I'm not I mean mostly I got like great things from training it was just it's just specifically I often wonder like well if I had just more spine and and I could have encountered those people and been in that situation what I could have got from it but it's all it's all sort of hindsight I do think that while at the same time it's like all you have also it's not strange I don't think for an artist or a creative person to be afraid of what that light is or to actually of their own choice, ignore it now and then because it's difficult, Mm -hmm. you know, then, well, speaking as an actor, you know, when you're guided by the light, then you're going to be like really implicated in the circumstances of Romeo and Juliet, you know, then you're going to like really have something on the line as opposed to, um, use kind of pure technique to get through or to make it work or to make it like palatable to an audience, you know, there's this great thing that I got. This is last couple of years. I got this from a, this Russian director who uh, comes over and works with this acting group that I'm that I'm part of in New York, and uh, he's, he's fantastic. And and uh, he tells this story of uh, this man walks into the circus and says, I, "I have an amazing trick to the ringmaster." The ringmaster says, "Okay, yeah, let me see it." And so the man climbed all the way up to the highest part of the big top, right, on the ladder, and jumps straight down, head first, bam, right in the bottom, right, gets up. And the ringleader says, that's a fantastic trick. Can you do it again? And he says, yeah, but the thing is, it hurts. (laughs) <laughs> and, I mean, that's it, right? And and he was and the reason he told us this story was he had he was working at his theater on Waiting for Godot. Mm-hmm. And he and the way he was working on it was he had an old company and a young company. So he was doing it with, you know, a Vladimir and an Estragon who were, you know, maybe 50s. And then he had like the ones that were 20s. 
And he said, it's so interesting to see them work on it because the ones that are in their 20s, they just barrel right in. They're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's completely go there. Let's do it. Whereas the older actors are more careful. Because I mean, when you think about what's in that play, when you think right. about like what you're headed to, it's like you you wouldn't you wouldn't recklessly like run to connect to that. It sounds like Nathan was saying that you really have to kind of give something of yourself for a great performance. Yeah. Which I think that's something we've talked about on the show quite a bit when we were doing the podcast. Well, if there are no stakes in it for you as the performer, there are no stakes in it for the audience either. So Right. Right. If you're not feeling it, then nobody's feeling it. Exactly. So it seems to be pretty universal with actors. Yeah. I would agree. I think there's a theme here, like maybe that's why actors become actors. Maybe? Perhaps. I don't know. But we'll have more with Nathan Darrow after <laughs> this. <laughs> In the last several seasons, Nathan Darrow has had the pleasure to work on some of the biggest TV shows between House of Cards and Gotham. So in this next segment, he talks a little bit about what it's like to work with a great crew and someone like Kevin Spacey. Well, it's difficult for people to be present. Even, yeah. even people who are non-actors, just being present in the moment you're in, that's really hard to do sometimes. Especially on like a film set, because there's yeah. so much distraction between the camera guys and the lighting guys and the sound guys and catering around the corner and <laughs> whatever else. Like, how do you find that ability to narrow in and just focus on the performance with all of that stuff okay. going on? Well, because it is, it looks natural. To, a, to an observer, right. Right. but if anybody's been on a film set, like there's, there's nothing natural about a film set. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, depends on what we call natural, you know? I mean, it's, it's, well, it's all being made by animals. So like, is it well, not natural? Having, having, you know, 10 one Ks, you know, uh, blaring yeah, at you yeah, from no, one no. side of the room. The, the answer to your question um, is I would say According to my standard, I usually don't. I'm usually not successful in that. And then the trick becomes like, how tolerant of myself am I? <laughs> you know, like, am I going to now compound the problem, the problem, you know, by sort of, uh, I guess you would call it like quitting or giving up, you know, there's this kind of inner sense that says, okay, and along with this, along with how I feel I'm doing in the circumstances, I'm gonna now act the scene as best I can. Just kind of acquiesce yeah. to what it well, is. <laughs> sure, I mean, I mean, that's not to say that I'm not uh, on, a, on a path toward learning some, something about attention and relaxation, because I think that's like what the actor is, is going for. Mm -hmm. And I've found already, you know, I mean, speaking specifically with House of Cards, I mean, I was very, very green to all that stuff when we started that. And it was like, those things were total, I don't know if you would call them, I guess you would call them distractions. I mean, they were, it was just so interesting to me. Like, what is that guy doing? Like, what, he, he knows his job so well. And shit, what's my job? I don't know my job at all. You know, it's, <laughs> it is like... But I've noticed already, you know, that just keep, keep going, keep working at it, keep, you know, back up on the horse, that it's becoming different. And I think that I'm, I feel like I'm headed toward a place where they're not distractions. Mm -hmm. They're all helping. It's all right. helping. Right. Not, not just helping like, oh, that guy's making you look good. It's like helping because it's there, and like there's a that's a real human there. Well, that's they're, stimuli they're, for they're all part of the energy of, of putting it together. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Um, I mean, the crew on a film set is, I mean, they make so many movies great. I, I, this is a guess that I have. This is like a recent theory I have. Is 
I think they make so many movies great in addition to their own expertise within their department, which is, you know, which is significant. By being uh, sort of honest recipients of the scene, mm -hmm. by actually like attending to the scene, not in a way that, well, to contrast it with uh, the theater, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very involved in and love and, and, you know, always will. There is sometimes though a feeling in a rehearsal room where you have a lot of people that are there that are just like absolutely ready for it to be brilliant, you know, mm -hmm. which is a good thing, but it's also sometimes a bad thing because you're not necessarily feeling that. Whereas crew on a film set sometimes just giving you such an honest response that for an actor, that is gold, man. Mm -hmm. I had a quick question because you brought up House of Cards and you were mentioning earlier that you were kind of intimidated when you worked with David Fritz. How did you feel yeah. the first time you had to do a scene with Kevin Spacey? Oh, well, um, the first time I had to do a scene with Kevin Spacey was not in House of Cards. It was uh, in this play that we did. It was a production of Richard III that went around oh. the world. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That, this is what like led to me being on House of Cards. So I had worked with him already. Um, now, I hadn't worked with him on a movie, so it was different. You know, right. that's different. There was a different kind of attention and concentration. And also, it was an area in which, you know, he had me way trumped in experience. Not to say he doesn't have me trumped in experience on stage. He, he does, but it's, but it's less so. I was more, I was a little bit more. That, know, that was your element. Yeah. So you, you were okay there. Yeah. But... Um, no, all of that just added to it. I mean, it's somebody that I, um, that I, that I respect so much, um, you know, his work. Now, by that time, I also knew him as a person, you know, we were friends. So it was like, I felt that I had, uh, you know, I had support in that way. So doing the scene was, you know, it was good. It was like, no, this is, uh, this is a guy who's, uh, you know, you know, I know, I know he cares about me. I know that he understands like where I'm coming from as an actor and like where I want to, you know, how I want to develop. I didn't know that, that you did a stage yeah. play with him. Yeah. Yeah. So I killed him in that play. And you saved him in House of Cards. And that's exactly right. <laughs> Full circle. That's weird. Full circle. You know, Whitney, one of the things that I've always loved about the podcast and it's already coming true on our TV show is these conversations are moments of discovery with the performers and the artists that we have on the show. They lead places that you don't really expect. I didn't know that about Nathan having done Richard the Third, and that's how he got on House of Cards. I yeah, have no that's idea. That's so that. cool. I mean, it's cool on a number of different levels. A, that he got to tour the world with Kevin Spacey. Yeah. And B, that Kevin Spacey actually like helped him get on House of Cards. Like, that's awesome. I mean, Nathan is a very talented performer, whether he's on stage or on screen. So I can understand that Kevin Spacey saw him and went, you know what? You, you got something there. <laughs> Come. Well, and you could see the chemistry with them on, on screen on House of Cards. Absolutely. Especially those last few episodes when they really kind of established that relationship one final time before Meacham, uh, you know, made the big sacrifice for Francis. So, but um, we'll be back with more. Uh, Nathan Darrow on The Intellectual. Hello and welcome back to the show. Before the commercial break, we heard a little bit from Nathan regarding his work with Kevin Spacey. And now we're going to look at a clip where he talks about the tragic end to Meacham and the rise of Mr. Freeze. Did you know going into House of Cards that that was going to be the fate of your character? No. no I didn't. How, how did it feel to get that script? Um, yeah, it wasn't a script. It was, uh, I got a phone call from uh, Bo Willem on the creator, mm -hmm. um, a, you know, f maybe a few months before we started working on the fourth season that was, right? And then he just told me that that was how it was going to be. I mean, by that point, I was, I was anticipating myself just like, well, where's, 
where we go with this, you know? And that was certainly one of the scenarios that was in my mind. Mm -hmm. and, and it was one that was appealing to me. Because it I was thought, beautiful. I cried. Oh, <laughs> oh my. You. I cried. It was so sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You did such a great job, though. Gosh, thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, I, I, you know, the way I thought about the guy, the character, it just, it, it made total sense, you know, mm -hmm. it made total sense that that was, this guy has had a war experience, an intense one. So there's no, there's kind of no meaning in life anymore if you can't like die for somebody, I think. Right. I think that was his thing, you know. Um, I don't know that he knew that that was exactly what he was about or what was his thing. Uh, because actually I think that he, he, he didn't necessarily want to die for somebody, but he, he, he needed that level of devotion and closeness, you know, my only problem at the end was that, uh, was that he got hit at all. You know, <laughs> if I was writing it, he would, uh, he would have been totally unscathed because <laughs> because he's a superhero and yeah. then you jump to be no, a superhero no I would be dead and Francis would be totally uh, not hit gotcha right. right right so it was a flawed success hey. cool. right. <laughs> um, how did you come to find yourself on Gotham right um, well I just I just auditioned for that part yeah uh, and I remember it was in this house actually that I'd gotten the, the script and it was gonna be like the next day or something. I mean, it was a quick kind of turnover. I had to kind of work on it. And I, I went up to this room upstairs and we had nothing in this house. And I just kind of, you know, was there myself with it. And I just loved the, uh, I loved the writing. I loved how it was, you know, unpacked. And, and I just found that it was really interesting. So, you know, when that happens, you, you often feel like, well, I, I think I have a better chance of getting this than when I'm like, Oh, what is this? What do I do with this? You know? <laughs> so, so I just prepared pretty hard. And I remember I went in the next day and I just felt good about what happened and they hired me for the job. How did you approach the character? Um, cause I mean, I think most people's experience with Mr. Freeze is unfortunately the Joel Schumacher mm -hmm. tragedy <laughs> with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Harsh. Um, well, <laughs> you know, to be honest. <laughs> um, but Gotham is such a wildly darker and right. semi more realistic take on everything than, than what we were presented with back then in the nineties. Yeah. Um, what was the truth of the character for you? Right. How, did, how, did you um, well, how did you come to, to feel what yeah. Victor is going through? Right. Um, one thing I remember it was it very much felt felt to me like a person who needs to take care of things. Like he sort of needs to have things organized and properly understood uh, and also seen to, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and this is actually before I started to understand in s some of the backstories about him, the, the relationship with Nora. So like that was kind of the first thing. The first thing was was how interesting it was to be a guy who is used to having things like under his control. And that here's one that here's one that ain't. And and he's kind of so unwilling to see it, you know, just felt you know, felt very human and that was it initially. And then, and then we, we started working on it. Uh, and then it started to feel, you know, more, uh, more kind of personal and tender when, when I was working with, uh, the actor, uh, Kristen Hager who played Nora, you know, just kind of started to feel like, Oh yeah, this is, this is, she's all he's got, you know? Yeah. It was really fun. That's an interesting point too, because when, when you're reading a script, you have the one interpretation, which is your own, but then inevitably you have to perform with somebody in these scenes. How, how much do you enjoy that process of kind of rediscovering even the scene once you start getting to work with the other actors? I think I'm enjoying it more and more. I'm, I'm I think I, I spent a long period, um, sort of, 
focusing a lot on just what I was doing, you know, mm -hmm. kind of needing that to needing to understand all of that. And I think that it kept me from taking in, you know, the other, the other element. And, and I think, uh, until I started to let go of some of that, uh, I couldn't really let the, what the other actor was doing in. I think I, I, I sort of did a lot of kind of complaining to myself about like, oh, they're doing this, it makes it hard, blah, blah. When you're working on a character, I think like, I mean, all you're doing is you're trying to get things loose. You're actually just trying to get like air in there so that it can, so that it can be. And then, you know, you do learn a lot from the other actor. Mm -hmm. So as an actor, Whitney, um, what is your process of discovering a character and how, how do you enjoy that process of interacting with another actor once you've kind of made your own decisions? Uh, that is such a loaded question. Um, my process changes for each character really? and I have this whole lovely thesis. If you ever want to read it sometime from graduate school about the fact that your process does have to evolve continuously because you know, you are evolving as a person, but in regard to what Nathan was talking about, about finding more about the character through interactions with another actor. Absolutely. If you're not finding that growth, then you're not listening to your partner. Mm. Uh, I distinctly remember doing every tongue must confess and having a moment with the gentleman that I was acting opposite. And it was fun because I was playing, I was playing a ghost, <laughs> but the way he interpreted the script, he genuinely thought I was a real person. And the character, I think, genuinely thought that the person he was interacting with was a real person. So that was fun to discover that even though we were coming at it from different places, it was still right. Hmm. And knowing that he genuinely felt that way as well as his, as his character, it made me more empathetic to what he was experiencing as that ghost character. That's very cool. So. Awesome. Well, we'll have more with Nathan Darrow when we come back. So before the break, we were talking with Nathan about uh, working with other actors. Uh, in this segment, we talked to him a little bit about what it's like to work you know, <laughs> potentially with people who go to the extremes on how they behave as an actor. Uh, you know, his, Maybe don't share his technique. Yeah, well, his, his association with a DC show, of course, made me have to ask the question of what's it like if you're working with someone like a Jared Leto who you know, does like dead rats in your locker? A lot of actors want to feel it like they want to feel, you know, not feel everything, but they want to feel something. They want to right. feel like get, they want to get, they want to get close to the fire, you know? So if somebody like helps me to get close to the fire by sort of doing something shocking or something, whatever, I mean, maybe that's a gift to me in some, in some place in my life. I do though think that well, when I kind of consult with my vision of things, I think, well, no, that's not it eventually. Eventually, we're, eventually we are, we're very close to it now. I don't need your dead rat. Like, and you don't need to send it to me. Like, you're closer to it than you think, you know? Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we do that, we can be more, we can be more courageous and we can be more healthy, you know? Because... Right. We were just talking about, you know, people that are older, what you learn about life and how you can, you know, you can imagine more things because you've lived more. But man, the greatest actors are like kids that just, they turn it on on a dime, you know? I mean, they go, they go on a dime and they're right back out of it, right? Yeah. How the hell well, do they kids, do that? Kids are uninhibited. Okay. They don't have the walls. Okay. Yeah, they don't have okay. the walls. Okay. Uh, and I think, I think maybe to, 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 the, to the point I was saying is I think as you... As you grow older, you start to build walls, but then, which prohibits you from just really letting go and just kind of existing. So you fake it. But as you kind of relearn tragedy and, mm -hmm. and happiness and whatever else, and you can easily access it, 
then it kind of helps you break down those walls again mm -hmm. because you've got a tool set that you didn't have before. But a child has no walls and an open tool set. And they just kind of go, That's and they don't they don't worry about whether they're right and or no wrong. And no real just, disappointment. Yeah, exactly. So they just they have they have an uninhibited freedom well, that depends. you don't have depends as an adult. On, <laughs> depends on the child's experience, though, well, mind you. That's true. There's, that's true. There's children who know way more loss than me. But yeah, it's interesting. Interesting question because. I don't know, then you start to think like, well, hey, the walls are, that's part of life too. I mean, mm -hmm. why, you know, why do we have to reveal so? I kind of see what you're getting at though. Like the idea of if someone did do something and aggressed upon you and you are the type of person that that happens instantly, your walls are going to go up. That's not going to be good for working with right. that person. Right. But it, I think it depends on the actor. It depends yeah. on the person. Yeah, that's right. It does. Totally. It's been such an interesting conversation with Nathan. There were some great parts that for time we had to cut out, but Nathan had this whole theory on the Zen aspect of acting and that whatever you need to do as an actor to get there, do that, but harm no one in the process. And I really liked that. I told him, I'm like, that's like the Buddhist way of acting. Yeah. But if anyone wants to hear that portion, please go to our podcast because it's well worth it. Absolutely. And now we're going to listen to Nathan talk about what it's like to return to Victor Freeze, a character who has no hope left. Getting to a character like like Victor Freeze, um, do you see that character as a villain or do you see that character as a tragic hero that couldn't achieve what he was trying to achieve? Because it's a delightfully okay. complicated story it is. between him and Nora. Oh, it is. It is. Certainly. I think that once she's dead, you know, and she's beyond repair. Now, in some stories, he's still sort of trying to get her back, like mm -hmm. in some of the backstories and some, but I think in ours, in Gotham, as far as I understand it so far, like there's not any hope for that. He's actually now. No, he's a man without gosh, hope. I don't know what he, I mean, yes, he's, 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 um, well, gosh, I mean, you try to end it and you change into something. That's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. He then changes into something. I, I think that he's going to kind of the next thing, which is, you know, there's some people who get so heartbroken that all that's left for them is the pain of others. Misery loves company sort of situation. Uh, the only thing that can amuse me or can divert me is to, you know, just kind of try to try to go dead, try to try to, you know, but story still being told. I mean, mm -hmm. we could find out that there's a, we could find out there's burning even brighter in there. You know, who knows? When you think of coming back to that character, because um, I, I find. I'm a huge fan of, you know, comics and specifically of superheroes and supervillains. Um, coming back to a character like that who now is without hope, how do you find something new to bring to a character like that going forward? Like, where where do you come from? I mean, obviously, the, the initial thing is the struggle to try and take care of somebody. But well, if he's without hope now, how do you as an actor find... Well, a creative I, way to approach well, that. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that, uh, I think it's already interesting enough because I, I mean, I've, I mean, already it starts to make me think, well, have I ever been without hope? And for how long was that? Something got me out of it because I would say right now as a person that I, I do have hope or I have access to hope, mm -hmm. but that's good enough. I mean, that's enough. That's a, that's a big circumstance to try to like start to crawl inside of. And, uh, I mean, what is the person without hope? Well, and there's do? a great question in that. Like, even whenever you are absolutely hopeless, the persistence of hope, is there like a tiny, you know, right. Or, or at least, or even, or even its absence, like what, uh, if there's no hope, maybe there's pleasure. Hmm. Maybe there's pleasure somewhere. Let's find pleasure in pain. Maybe, yeah. Pleasure in pain, pleasure in my own pain, pleasure in somebody else's pain, or just 
or just maybe a pleasure that I haven't uh, investigated yet. You know, Whitney, that was probably one of my favorite exchanges in the whole conversation with Nathan was that whole discussion about coming back to play Victor Freeze after the man's lost all hope. I loved his answer to that question. If you have no hope, what drives you? And his pleasure, just the joy he took in that answer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see my face on there. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so cool because it is it is such a, a interesting question. How does one approach a character that has no hope, and to to discover in yourself that that character's motivation now is pleasure in pain or some other deal? Uh, that's fabulous. It's a fantastic bit of psychology to to approach a character with. And when we return, we'll recap our interview with Nathan Darrow and tell you a little bit more about the intellectual. So that's the conclusion of our interview with Nathan Darrow. Our very first episode of The Intellectual. That was a great start to the very first wonderful. intellectual. Nathan was great. What was your favorite part of the conversation with Nathan? My favorite part was when we asked him about challenges with actors who have different techniques than yourself. Specifically, we were talking about Jared Leto and all of the stories we've heard from Suicide Squad. But he was very thoughtful with that answer. And I liked watching him work through it. Because it's not something you think about until you encounter someone that is a challenge. Mm. So I really just enjoyed watching the conclusion that he came to, which was it's individual for each person. But for him, as long as it was all with goodwill, he was happy with it. Right. Yeah. What about for you? Um, you know, I think I think it was that question about coming back to a character that has no hope. Because, um, you know, I'm always talking as a director with my actors about their motivations, where their characters come from, and finding a a place of truth for themselves. And I think being without hope is a place that makes a lot of us very uncomfortable because hope is what kind of drives us forward. We're always hoping for something better. We're hoping for the next great thing in our lives. So to portray a character that's lost that, I think, is a dark place for somebody to go. It's a hard place to go. Yeah, so it was really fascinating to hear his answer. Like, his answer was... Kind of surprised me, honestly. You know, if I got no hope, I'm going to find pleasure. You know, such an enjoyable start to this series. I hope you guys come back because we have a lot of really great guests coming up soon, and a whole lot of great tricks up our sleeves. So, some more stuff coming from our New York trip, Mm -hmm. and, and it's all coming to you right here on the Intellectual. Thank you so much, Whitney. Thank you. Such a great start. And thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Don't forget to get the full unedited interview with Nathan Darrow on the Intellectual Podcast. And be sure to like us on Facebook at Intellectual Entertainment. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Intellectual. And use hashtag IXE debut to join in the conversation. And don't forget to subscribe to Intellectual Network on YouTube.